World War II England, a German pilot defies all odds, concocting a bold and risky plan for escape. Before he could fly, he has to crawl. On October 12, 1940, the normally serene hillsides of England's Lake District resounded with the barking of dogs and the tramping boots of the local police and the British Army. They were looking for a German, an escaped prisoner of war. The Battle of Britain had raged throughout the summer and into the fall as Hitler's Luftwaffe tried desperately to wrest control of the skies from the RAF. The Battle of Britain was just, in the simplest terms, a matter of air superiority. For the Germans to uh, stage the invasion of Britain, they needed air superiority over the beaches. And until they could establish that, there was no way that they could proceed. However, the British were proving much tougher than Hitler's high command had anticipated. Before the battle was over, the Germans would lose more than 1,700 aircraft, nearly twice as many as the British. And while RAF airmen bailed out over friendly soil, Thousands of Luftwaffe crewmen were captured, interrogated, and imprisoned. The prisoners fell into two distinctive camps. One group were fairly happy to accept imprisonment and wait for their release. Others, the men of action, if you like to call them that, were uh, about wanting to get out and uh, cause problems. One of these troublemakers was First Lieutenant Franz von Vera, a 27-year-old fighter pilot. He had been captured September 5, 1940, after being shot down during a bombing raid. Von Vera was a notorious show-off, whose charismatic charm made him a darling of the German media. He kept a lion cub as his unit's mascot and claimed to be a disenfranchised bearer wearing a large signet ring, which bore his family's coat of arms. And this, this picture, of course, got to British intelligence. So as soon as he was picked up, it was pretty clear who he was right, right from the word go. Von Vera had escaped from the Grisdale Hall POW camp and had been on the run for five days. But now, his pursuers had him surrounded. With nowhere left to run, he had tried to hide in the underbrush. I surrender! Franz von Vera was finally recaptured. After serving 19 days in solitary confinement, von Vera was transferred to Officers Transit Camp Number 13, near the village of Swanwick, north of London. He found many former comrades in arms among the prisoners, including Ulrich Steinhilber, a fellow fighter pilot whom he knew from flight training school. Von Vera immediately asked him if there was a way to escape. We didn't even have time enough to talk to each other about how we were shut down. I said, don't you know England is an island? You cannot get home from here, he said. I will try, I have tried once, I will keep on. Blackout is at 10. Two obstacles stood in his way. The first was getting out of Swanwick. The second was getting out of England. Still, he was determined to succeed. Gentlemen, it'll be a special mail this morning. Red Cross packages. You can pick them up in the corporal's office. His confidence and conviction inspired his fellow officers, 
and even those of higher rank deferred to his leadership. All right, then, roll call. Fritz? Yeah. Oscar? Here. He quickly Helmut. assembled Here. a crew. Bandera? Here. The Arnold. first was Lieutenant Walter Manhart. Here. Followed by Lieutenants Hans Wilhelm. Here. And Doc Wagner. Here. The fifth man was Major Heinz Kramer. We were walking around the uh, barbed wire and didn't find uh, that there was any opportunity. We couldn't uh, imagine anything else, so we just turned to the classic way uh, to build the tunnel. Here! Helmut! Here! Roll call was taken at breakfast and twice in the evening, but not at lunch. Friedrich! Here! All right then. So by skipping the midday meal, the men were able to work uninterrupted from roughly 10 until 4. Right then. Dismiss. Von Vera jokingly named their group the Swanwick Construction Company. Although only five men would be escaped, the entire camp was involved in the effort. An elaborate network of lookouts was set up so that warning signals could be passed quickly to the men doing the digging. An unused room in the north wing was the starting point. From there, it was less than 15 yards to the barbed wire. The excavation would pass mere feet from the base of the guard tower, but it was a risk they would have to take. A carefully cut section of floor disguised the entrance. Their tools were provided by the British. Scoops and fire buckets, meant for disposing of incendiary bombs, made short work of the dirt beneath the barracks. With a jam jar and bits of wire, they rigged a makeshift work lamp. It often gave them nasty shocks. Two men took turns digging, while the others concealed the evidence by dumping the dirt in a cistern on the barracks lawn. Passing so close to the guard tower, any heavy labor in the tunnel could potentially be heard above ground. Doesn't go halt. Stand. So the lamp also served as a warning signal. The network of men stationed in the hallways could pass the alarm quickly enough. So call. Although the entrance could be hidden in seconds, the telltale signs of digging could not. If the British had come to investigate, they would have found the prisoners covered in fresh dirt. It was so close to the ground level that it was dangerous that the guards inside or outside might even see, at least hear it. So it was always decided to make noise. From that point on, whenever the men were digging, Diversion crews went into action. Arguing, singing, and playing the gramophone. Mm. While the team spent their days tunneling, at night they discussed their plans to get out of England. Wagner and Wilhelm decided to head for Liverpool, where they would attempt to stow away on a neutral ship. Kramer and Manhard would try for Glasgow, 
where they also hope to stow away. But Von Vera had something much more audacious in mind. He planned to find the nearest airfield, bluff his way onto the base, and steal a plane. <laughs> his idea was to make contact with the RAF directly or through the police and to maintain that he was a Dutch pilot, Captain Van Lott, who'd been flying a Wellington bomber with an experimental bomb site and that, that had to put the, the aircraft down, but he needed to get back to his base in Scotland very quickly to report, and it was all top secret. We knew that Dutch pilots had escaped to England. Mm -hmm. We knew that Dutch pilots were flying for the RAF. He was suspicious that his German would come through. But Dutch is quite similar to German, so he decided, language-wise, Dutch would fit. To equip himself for this charade, von Vera borrowed articles from other prisoners. A flight suit from one, boots from another, a pair of flying gloves from a third. He would also need some kind of ID. On the pretext of settling a bet, he tricked a British corporal into showing him his identity tag. While the men joked about the bet, they examined the disc, noting the look and feel of it. One of the forgers took an imprint of its exact size by pressing the disc against the palm of his hand. What did I tell you? What did I tell you? Thank you very much, Uncle Farrell. Now, they just needed to find some way to copy it. In the meantime, a problem was developing with the dig. They were running out of air. Going up to the face and back was like swimming the length of a pool underwater. Work had slowed to a near standstill, and they were only halfway to the barbed wire. So what are we going to do? Then fate dealt them another blow. They were digging the tunnel close to the fence. They were meeting with a sewage pipe, a large sewage pipe. Trying to go underneath it wasn't possible because water collects it below the pipe. So they had to go over it. Going over the pipe would bring the tunnel dangerously close to ground level, dramatically increasing the risk of detection, or even worse, collapse but it was their only option. They retreated a few precious yards and started sloping the tunnel carefully upward toward the surface. There was so little oxygen, a man could only stay at the far end of the tunnel for a minute or two. Walter Manhard was working the face when the unthinkable happened. There was a cave. Walter! 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 The prisoner's escape tunnel had collapsed, and it seemed Lieutenant Walter Manhart had been buried alive. <laughs> Although shaken, Manhart was uninjured by the cave -in. When Franz von Vera returned to assess the damage, he found the lamp was still working. And the disaster was a blessing in disguise. The British had buried rolls of barbed wire along the perimeter of the camp to keep prisoners from digging under the fence at ground level. But they never imagined someone might come up on it from underneath. The buried wire supported the ground above it, allowing much needed air to filter down to the tunnel. The Swanwick Construction Company was back in business. 
work now progressed at a rapid rate. On December 17th, while the others watched, Manhard tested the exit point by poking a stick up through the last few inches of dirt. It appeared outside the barbed wire. The tunnel had taken an entire month, but they were through. They decided to make their break the following Friday. As fate would have it, a bombing raid was launched that night. The sound of the Luftwaffe bombs was music to the Germans' ears. It was a perfect diversion, and the forced blackout would give them better cover. It was time for von Vera to become Captain von Lott. His only props were some British cigarettes and the camp copy of the Times. With little more than charm and bravado to bolster his story, he prepared to leave the safety of the camp in search of an enemy airfield. When you change from the dull life of POW to try to escape, you are changing your life completely because now you are back at war. Because now you are going to be shot at. We were, the barbed wire behind us, the five of us, cleaning from uh, the reddish dust. And uh, we promised each other Christmas at Berlin. The five men were out but there was no time for celebration. The tunnel exit was camouflaged so that if undiscovered, others could use it at a later date. Their escape from camp was a success, but now they faced the real challenge, avoiding capture and getting out of England. Cromer and Manhard went north toward Scotland and Wagner and Wilhelm northwest toward Liverpool. While Franz von Vera headed right into the arms of the enemy. He had convinced a railroad worker that he was Captain von Lott, a downed Dutch pilot, and persuaded the man to call an airfield. He, he was a very outward going person, a very able, actor and probably able to read the way people's thoughts were going and to, to guide them in his own way. He was picked up from the railway station by an RAF driver in a vehicle and because he approached the, the Air Force base in the vehicle he would have automatically been allowed in. The duty officer at the airbase had sent a car to pick up Captain von Lott, the Dutch pilot, but he found one thing strange there was no rank of captain in the RAF. The duty officer wanted to get a look at Captain von Lott in person. Sir, this is von Lott. Vera repeated his story for the duty officer. 
He said he was part of the mixed special bomber squadron based at Aberdeen. There was no such squadron, but von Vera hoped it would sound cryptic enough to be believable. Air Force, the plane crashed into falling here. The officer placed a call to Aberdeen to verify the story. May I have the command duty post for Aberdeen? Yes. There you go. Tally ho. Tally ho. Von Vera knew it was now or never. He casually excused himself to go to the washroom. Yes. Certainly. Where he quickly scrambled out a window and hurried across the tarmac. No, I can barely hear you. He spotted a mechanic working on a hurricane fighter. He presented himself as Captain Von Lott and said he had been sent to make a practice flight. Pilots of many nationalities were serving with the RAF, and the mechanic didn't find this request unusual. He told Von Vera that he needed to complete some paperwork before he could take the plane. Von Vera signed the logbook as Von Lott but when he listed his nationality, he nearly gave himself away by making a telltale German-style stroke over the U in Dutch. But no one in the office noticed, and they signed over a brand new British plane to a German pilot. Now that he was finally sitting in the cockpit, Von Vera's impatience to be airborne was almost uncontrollable. Surely the duty officer had discovered his rules by now. The mechanic gave him a quick briefing on the controls, then climbed down to hook up the battery. Yes, no agony? Every passing second was agony. He tried to calm himself by making sense of the English indicator panel miles per hour would have to be converted to kilometers, feet to meters. Very good, thank you. Is he? Yes? Stop, and get out of the plane! But just as he was about to start the engine, his luck ran out. The duty officer had tracked him down. Had he been only a minute or two later, Von Vera could have been airborne. Instead, he surrendered and claimed the protection of the Geneva Convention. All five escapees were recaptured. You are under arrest. Shortly thereafter, most of the prisoners at Swanwick, including Von Vera, were transferred to a POW camp in Canada. But Von Vera, never reached it. He escaped again, this time to freedom. On January 24th, 1941, 11 months before Pearl Harbor, he crossed the Canadian border into the then neutral United States. While the diplomats were trying to decide his fate, the German embassy smuggled him out of the country, through South America and back to Germany where he rejoined his unit. On October 25th, 1941, he was leading a patrol of three fighters up the coast of Holland when his engine apparently failed. He was in radio contact at the time. His uh, last words were, friends, I think I have to take a bath. I would appreciate you to look after me. This was uh, the end of his life. He had kept his uh, special style to the end. No trace of Franz von Vera or his